by mid-afternoon. And the milder air returns to the southwest, 12 Celsius here, whilst it stays cold, where we've got the brighter weather further east. The cloud and rain make their way across the country during the evening, some mountain snow for Scotland, followed by showers, and those showers will continue into Friday, particularly across western parts of the country, but there'll be some sunshine in between. And Saturday sees another area of rain move in from the west. It will also turn milder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Good afternoon. It's time to debate the big issues of the day with me, Gloria DiPiero, Liam Halligan, and a whole host of experts. A year ago, 91-year-old Margaret Keenan received the first COVID jab. Since then, nearly 120 million people have been given it here in the UK. But 12 months on, we're now facing a number of unknowns over a new variant of the virus, with some reports suggesting it could even evade vaccines. So today, we're asking, Omicron. Should we be worried about the new Coronas variant? That's after the news with Paul. Thanks, Gloria. Our top story at two. Boris Johnson has ordered an investigation into an alleged Downing Street Christmas party after a heated Prime Minister's questions. Follows a video leaked to ITV News showing the PM's former press secretary, Allegra Stratton, answering questions during a mock briefing four days after the alleged party happened while the country was under lockdown restrictions. Would the Prime Minister condone uh, having a Christmas? <laughs> What's the answer? I don't know. I didn't... Wasn't the party? It was cheese and wine. Just clear, it's not. <laughs> Is cheese and wine all right? No. It was a business <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I'm joking. Well, here's what the Prime Minister had to say about the video this lunchtime. I can understand how infuriating it must be to think that the people who have been setting the rules have not been following the rules, Mr Speaker, because I was also furious to see that clip. I've asked the Cabinet Secretary to establish... But Labour's Sakir Starmer says the Prime Minister's apology raises more questions than answers. They knew there was a party. They knew it was against the rules. They knew they couldn't admit it. And they thought it was funny. It's obvious what happened. The Prime Minister has been caught red-handed. Why doesn't he end the investigation right now 
by just admitting it, that we are facing a new variant, yep. we may well be in Plan B this afternoon. Even the Prime Minister, yep. even the Prime Minister must, must understand the damage he's done to yep. his credibility yep. in enforcing the rules now and in the future. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson is considering new COVID restrictions, including orders to work from home and vaccine passports to manage the Omicron variant. Downing Street sources insist no decisions have been made. However, one of the UK's top COVID advisers has warned another nationwide lockdown cannot be ruled out. Professor Neil Ferguson says the Omicron variant is concerning, but it's not completely known what its impact will be. From today, if you're over 40 in England, you can now book your COVID booster jab three months after receiving your second vaccine. This change makes an extra 7 million people now eligible for the third jab. It's exactly a year ago to the day that the first coronavirus vaccine was given in the UK. Roughly 1,000 properties are without power after Storm Barra swept across the country. The power cuts follow Storm Arwen, which caused catastrophic damage to electricity networks. Flood warnings have also been issued across the UK and a yellow weather warning for wind is in place across the west coast of Wales and southwest England until 6pm. The Mercedes Formula One team has ended its sponsorship deal with the insulation company Kingspan following a backlash over its links to Grenfell Tower. Kingspan made some of the insulation at Grenfell but says it wasn't involved in the design of the cladding system. 72 people were killed in a fire at the tower block in 2017. Elsewhere this afternoon, the UK and other Western countries say they will work together to encourage Russia to back down over what they are calling threatening behaviour towards Ukraine. Their talks follow a meeting between the President uh, Joe Biden and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin in which the US warned of severe sanctions if Russia invades Ukraine. An estimated 100,000 Russian troops are now gathered on the Ukrainian border. Boris Johnson says there will effectively be a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics in Beijing, as UK ministers will not be attending. This follows Australia's decision to join the US in a diplomatic boycott of next year's Olympics over human rights concerns. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison says it is the right thing to do. Despite the move, Australian and UK athletes will still be able to compete in the Games. You're up to date with the latest. We'll have more for you in 25 minutes. Coming up today on De Piero and Halligan, reports suggest the government's looking to implement stricter coronavirus restrictions with a work from home order in the pipeline. There's increasing concern with the new Omicron variant and whether it can evade vaccines. So we'll be talking about Omicron and asking how worried should we be? And it was a fiery Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons earlier. Millions of people now think the Prime Minister was taking them for fools yeah, yeah. and that they were lied to. Yeah, yeah. They're right, aren't they? Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer there strongly condemning the Prime Minister after a video obtained by ITV News showed Boris Johnson's then press secretary joking about holding a Christmas party last year when we were all locked down. So where does this leave the Prime Minister and the Conservative Party? Join the debate with your view. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk. Let us know how worried you are. Or tweet us at gbnews. Also, how worried are you about the new restrictions? Is it the right thing to do, the sensible thing to do to bring back work from home? Now, one year on from the first approved coronavirus jab, the threat of another variant is looming over our Christmas plans. Face masks are back in shops and on public transport with concern over the effectiveness of the vaccine against the new Omicron variant. There's also reports the government may be close to bringing in Plan B restrictions, including a work-from-home order. So today we're asking, how worried should we be about this new Variant. That's what we're hoping to answer today. So let's kick things off with Professor Lawrence Young, a virologist at the University of Warwick. Professor, thank you for joining us. What do we know about Omicron and its transition rate so far? Well, we know it's spreading very rapidly and spreading probably doubling every two to three days in this country. It's now been found in 57 seven different countries. Um, so it is very transmissible. It took over from Delta in South Africa, and it looks like it's going to dominate infections in the UK within a matter of weeks. 
Good to see you, Professor Young. Um, you're much more up to date than me. This is very much your field. The last World Health Organization report that I saw a couple of days ago indicated that, yes, there's a growing number of countries where Omicron has been uh, detected. But so far, am I right in saying there have been no deaths and symptoms have been, quotes, relatively mild? Yes. So looking at the data, and of course, the best data we have is coming out slowly but surely from South Africa because they've got the most concentrated impact of Omicron. What they're seeing there is a, a massive increase in the number of cases. They have over the last three weeks seen something like a six-fold increase in hospitalizations. But most of this is with people who have relatively mild disease. And even in hospital, individuals aren't having to stay for too long. And actually, what's interesting is if you compare what's going on with intensive care bed occupancy in South Africa. If you go back and look at what happened when they had similar number of Delta infections, they had many, 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 many more uh, uh, intensive care ventilated in patients than they do now. So all of this together suggests, and we have to be careful, it suggests that if you are vaccinated, you can get infected, but that actually this results in mild disease we have to wait to get more information. There's always this lag, isn't there, between infections, getting sick, and sadly, those people get poorly and get hospitalised. But at the moment, it's looking like a lot of the infections are mild. Why is the government about to introduce new restrictions then? I think it's because it's spreading so fast. We've got some data today from two different groups, one of them South African researchers and the other Pfizer themselves has literally in the last hour announced some preliminary data demonstrating what we all suspected, which is that vaccine-induced immunity is affected by Omicron. Omicron can get around some of that, but not to the degree where if you're fully vaccinated and boosted, you'll get severe disease. But this is the problem. The problem is if Omicron is spreading so fast, case numbers will go extremely high, and even a small proportion of people being hospitalized quickly becomes a large number. On top of very high levels of Delta that we have in this country, there is a concern with the rate of transmission and what that might do, not only to our individual health in the run-up to Christmas, but also to the NHS. Professor Young, since we started broadcasting on GB News over the summer, you've been on our show many times. You always struck me as a very even-handed um, person who followed the research. So let me ask you this. Do you think, in your professional opinion, we need tighter restrictions over the Christmas period? Could we see, based on current evidence, uh, similar controls to last Christmas? Well, of course, I hope not. I don't think we're in a position where we need extreme measures, extreme lockdown. Listen, we're so much better. We are celebrating today, aren't we, a year since the first jab at Margaret Keenan in, in the hospital that I'm associated with by coincidence in Coventry received that jab. We're in a much, much stronger position. But there's so much uncertainty with Omicron that we do need to do as much as we can to you know, restrict these chains of transmission. And that's all about face masks in areas. It's all about limiting large gatherings. For me, actually, and for, you know, for people I'm talking to, it's a, an issue about protecting your Christmas. So it, the worst possible thing for all of us is to go and get infected over the next week by going to a big do with lots of people who perhaps aren't being as careful as they should, getting infected and then having to isolate over the Christmas and missing Christmas with your family or friends, or even if you're not paying too much attention, you don't want to infect granny over Christmas. So I think it's about being careful over the next few weeks, recognising something, I guess, that we all knew really, which this could never be a normal, normal Christmas but it's going to be a lot better than last year, particularly if we're all cautious over the next few weeks. Fingers and toes crossed. Professor Lawrence Young, Professor of Virology at the University of Warwick, thanks as ever for your time and expertise. Let's now speak to Professor of Primary Care and Public Health at Imperial College London, Asim Majid. Uh, nice to see you again. Let's focus on the vaccine. What do we know about the effectiveness of the vaccine against the new Omicron variant? Uh, so as uh, mentioned by Professor Young, there's some evidence that the vaccines may be a bit less effective against uh, the new variant Omicron than the previous variants. Uh, but the good news is that Pfizer say that three doses of the vaccine uh, will probably work well against Omicron. So if you are fully vaccinated, including with a booster, uh, that should protect you against serious illness and death 
and hopefully keep down the severity of your illness um, in, in the future. So uh, there's mixed news, but overall, vaccines should still work well, particularly if you've got three doses of, of vaccine. We are, of course, waiting on lots of research to come out, aren't we, Professor? How long do you think it will be until we have more evidence from uh, the likes of Pfizer and AstraZeneca from South Africa, indeed, they've pioneered the sequencing of this particular variant from the World Health Organization. Uh, data's already coming through. So today, Pfizer announced uh, the results of a study which showed that three doses of vaccine work well in, in the laboratory and in, in try to neutralize uh, the virus. So data's already coming through. UK data will come through probably in the next week or two. So I think by Christmas, We'll have a lot more answers to the questions we're facing at the moment about how severe this, uh, this variant is. Is it more infectious than previous variants? Will it, will it cause a more severe illness? Will it evade vaccines? That data will, will, will all come through in the, in the next few weeks. So I think by Christmas, we'll have probably quite good data on the variants. How worried are you about Christmas? What should we do ahead of Christmas? Presumably, you're going to say, get your booster. <laughs> yeah, that's the most important thing, getting a booster vaccine, uh, but also behaving sensibly, you know, so um, if you've got older relatives, for example, you know, being careful about your social activities in the next few weeks, uh, you know, wear a face mask in indoor settings when you, you can't, uh, you know, isolate yourself with other people, um, be cautious about large indoor gatherings with many people present, particularly if they're in crowded venues with poor ventilation. Uh, so I think those are the main measures you can take, uh, and hopefully through vaccination and, and behaving sensibly, we can avoid additional measures like lockdowns and so on and have a more normal Christmas this year compared to, uh, to, compared to last year. Professor Azim Majid, Professor of Primary Care and Public Health at Imperial College London, thanks to you as well for your time and expertise. If more restrictions are imposed, can the Economy Corp joining us now as the Chief Economic Strategist at Net Wealth and former Economic Advisor to Boris Johnson, Gerard Lyons. Jared, work from home <laughs> guidance, orders, it's on the cards. It could come in as early as midnight tonight. Sensible or worrying for the economy? Well, I wouldn't say it's worrying for the economy because the people who are likely to be instructed to work from home have already become accustomed to working from home. And as we've seen, particularly in the second and third lockdown, not all parts of the economy had to work from home and more parts of the economy got back to normal. But the reality of the situation is that we're having to live with COVID. So hence, we need to be concerned about the new variant. But I think it's important that we do not panic. And therefore, in terms of coming back to your question, I think the economy can cope. But clearly, um, if there were no further restrictions, then that would be better for the economy. Say, Jerry, that already the economy is taking a hit because of because of this already, just given yeah. talk of some new restrictions, talk of semi-lockdown, the travel industry has been hammered. The hospitality industry is taking a big knock ahead of Christmas after 18 months, two years of slow trading. It strikes me that Rishi Sunak's growth forecasts are in danger of being missed quite badly. And if so, the public finances get worse less government spending, potentially more taxes. Well, you've jumped a couple of hoops there, shall we say, Liam. But certainly, if we come back to the first part of your comments, yeah, the last 18 months have given us good insight into how the economy is likely to be impacted by this new variant. Over the last 18 months, we've seen when we've had the various phases of this pandemic that there's been a direct impact through government restrictions, and in particular through the lockdowns. That has hit the economy and indirectly there's been an impact as people themselves and firms have adjusted anyway without the government having to take action and indeed in the last week and a half as you touched on hospitality and other parts of the economy have already suffered that's more because people and firms themselves have reacted and they've reacted more to the uncertainty uh, the news that hit us a week and a half ago was rather cataclysmic as we've seen more information come out and as your two previous guests have indicated, this variant, while we need to take it seriously, it appears that given the vaccinations and boosters we have in the UK, the economy and more generally the population should be able to cope. So therefore, there is a direct impact from any actions the government takes. 
And then there's the indirect impact in terms of how people and firms themselves react. And I think it's been the latter impact that has been evident in the last 18 months, or last week and a half, rather. Uh, if the government takes further actions tonight, then that will dampen things. The hospitality sector, I did about 5% of the economy, naturally this time of the year is the most important time for parts of the hospitality sector. So one should not underestimate the hit being felt by a number of key firms across the economy. The economy, whilst it will be impacted by this variant, will be able to cope. And indeed, early, just take the last 18 months as an example to answer your question, Liam. In March, April last year, the economy fell off a cliff. May of last year, then hit bottom. Then it started to recover as we came out of the first lockdown, hit a mini peak in October. Then from then until the beginning of this year, we uh, for, to springtime, we had second, third lockdowns that hit the economy, but we've been on the steady upward path. I think this variant and the uncertainty around it makes the near term outlook uncertain. It will give the economy a hit in December relative to where it should have been. But I think even though people aren't going to have a spending spree post Christmas, uh, the economy itself will start to continue to recover, I would suggest, as we move through the first quarter of next year. So whilst it will have an impact in terms of the growth picture, I don't think it should have a negative impact overall in terms of the revenue side, in the sense that the economy will eventually bounce back, government revenue side that is. Pound has dropped to its lowest level in more than a year against the dollar. I'm not an economist. How does that impact on our lives? Well, um, I think it's important to put in context why the pound has weakened against the dollar. That's been largely in the last couple of weeks due to safe haven aspects. The US is seen as a safe haven in times of uncertainty by international investors, but more particularly in terms of UK versus the US and hence the pound against the dollar. It's about interest rate expectations. In the last week and a half, the US Federal Reserve, their equivalent of our Bank of England, has indicated that they're prepared to tighten policy quicker. That makes sense because the US economy is recovering. In contrast, the latest news in the UK is that the Bank of England is now thinking twice about tightening policy in December and keeping interest rates at 0.1%. UK interest rates are far too low given monetary stability and the need for financial stability. Even with this new variant, UK interest rates are far lower given the inflation threat. But coming back to your direct question, the pound has weakened against the dollar largely because of the interest rate expectations. I don't think it will directly have a too negative an impact, but what is interesting is that the Bank of England and UK policymakers have not really looked to the exchange rate as a policy tool to be used to curb imported inflationary pressures. One could have argued the stronger pound in recent months would have capped but not removed some of that inflation pressure coming through. Certainly, if the pound were to stay weak and inflation internationally were to continue to pick up, as it has done over the last year and a half, then it will see a bigger pass through of inflationary pressures into the UK economy. How that then is passed on in terms of the high street amongst companies and in terms of wage pressures would then very much influence the final inflation outlook. So a weaker pound often people think is good for exports, uh, but given the global economy impacted by this pandemic, the weaker pound has more of an impact, but it's very marginal, one has to say, at the moment, given the degree of movement in the last week and a half, has a more negative impact on the inflation front. Dr. Jared Lyons, Chief Economic Strategist at NetWell, thanks a lot for your time and for joining us here on De Pierre and Halligan. So we've heard from some experts on how worried we should be about the new Omicron variant, but we want to know what you think about this. You can email in to share your views on gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. We've also started a poll on this over on the GB News Twitter page. You can add your vote via at GB News on whether you think or you are worried about the new variant here in the UK. We'll be reviewing those results later on in the programme, so stay with us. Up next, it's worse than a Christmas cracker joke. Footage of Boris Johnson's former press secretary laughing about a possible Christmas party in South Downing Street last year when we were all in lockdown. Boris Johnson was indeed under intense pressure during Prime Minister's questions earlier today. So what next for him and for the Conservative Party? We'll discuss that next. But first, it's the weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter.
Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Storm Barra may be now easing, but it stays windy through the rest of today with further showers or, in some places, prolonged rain. But there will be some drier periods. Barra is still centred across the UK, but it's filling. It's becoming less severe. Nevertheless, strong winds continue to rotate around that low, particularly around the peripheries of it, northeast Scotland, into parts of Northern Ireland, West Wales, and the southwest. And it's for West Wales as well as the southwest where the strongest wind gusts will be this afternoon, 65 mile per hour wind gusts at risk of disruption. And further bands of showers and rain affecting northeast Scotland, Northern Ireland, parts of Western England and Wales. Prolonged rain in places. So feeling quite cold where we've got the rain coming through, where we've got that strong wind, highs of just 8 Celsius. But there will be some drier weather. The Midlands, East Anglia, South East England, Western Scotland, the favoured spots for some drier and brighter interludes at times through the day. And overnight, clearing skies across parts of northern UK in particular, with lighter winds eventually will lead to a touch of frost in places, say for northeast England, parts of central Scotland. Otherwise, a lot of cloud and further showers coming and going, one or two making their way further east as we start off Thursday. But eventually, by the afternoon, things do start to brighten up. Cloudy initially in the east, but by the afternoon, sunny spells coming through. Whilst a reverse of fortunes further west, it turns cloudy with areas of rain moving in by mid-afternoon. And the milder air returns to the southwest, 12 Celsius here, whilst it stays cold where we've got the brighter weather further east. The cloud and rain make their way across the country during the evening, some mountain snow for Scotland, followed by showers, and those showers will continue into Friday, particularly across western parts of the country, but there'll be some sunshine in between. And Saturday sees another area of rain move in from the west. It will also turn milder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Well, it was certainly no party at Prime Minister's Questions this afternoon for Boris Johnson. He faced intense criticism and questioning from MPs over whether there was or not a Christmas party at Downing Street last year while we were all in lockdown, away from our families. Not only this, but Nicola Sturgeon is now urging Boris Johnson to come clean over the Christmas party. This video from ITV shows the Prime Minister's former press secretary, Allegra Stratton, appearing to joke about a possible party within number 10. Well, let's speak to our political editor. It's Darren McCaffrey. Darren, you were watching PMQs closely, of course. Do you think Boris Johnson did anything to calm tensions 
during that session opposite Keir Starmer this afternoon? Yeah, I was in that chamber, Liam, in the press gallery. I have to say, you know, I've seen many PMQs over the years. That was a really, really tough one uh, for Boris Johnson. Uh, Keir Starmer had an open net in many regards, uh, but certainly uh, got many goals uh, in trying to, I suppose, convey to a degree, I think, the public anger about this story, but also to raise uh, lots and lots of questions. Of course, the Prime Minister was forced to apologise. He said he was sickened and furious by that video, and that also he was launching or getting Simon Case, who is the Cabinet Secretary here, to launch an investigation into what precisely went on on the 18th of December. Now, the big question is, why is the Cabinet Secretary investigating something if, up until today, the Prime Minister has repeatedly insisted that there wasn't a party? So what is there to investigate? It's clear something did happen in Downing Street. It's clear the Prime Minister wants to get to the bottom of it. He insists that he was given assurances that no rules were broken. That's why he made those public statements. But in the end, as always with these stories, it actually raises some more questions than it fundamentally answers. Uh, not least of all, we did find out from Downing Street after Prime Minister's question time uh, that the Prime Minister was not in attendance at that gathering. But they also refused to answer questions about whether Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, himself may well have been at that party. Could you potentially have a Cabinet Secretary investigating a party that he was potentially at? And also, in addition to that, there are also further allegations that this wasn't the only party that was held in December and November. Suggestions that up to three other parties were held that the Prime Minister may well have attended, though they're currently not inside the remit, we believe, of the Cabinet Secretary's investigations. You find this, don't you, sometimes, uh, Liam, actually, that these kind of stories snowball, that once you answer some set of questions, a whole other load of questions... Uh, come about. I don't think we're going to find the conclusion of these investigations anytime soon. Uh, this is an embarrassing and difficult moment. I've spoken to an awful lot of Conservative MPs in the Commons in the last couple of hours. They are pretty flipping furious, let me be clear, about what has gone on, about the Prime Minister's judgment, and that yet again the government seems mired in a mess, largely of their own creation. Um, and Darren, what about the rest of us? There's reports of increased restrictions likely to be announced later today. Is that confirmed? It's not. And there was much speculation, must be said, this morning that we could well see a cabinet meeting this afternoon or a meeting with some of the Prime Minister's closest advisers, at the very least, and that we could hear uh, a press conference or, or see a press conference and a statement inside the Commons. Now, Downing Street haven't denied that it's going to happen. They haven't necessarily stayed as massively away from but They have somewhat dampened that speculation is going to happen this afternoon. I think in the end, whether it's today, tomorrow, the day after, it does look increasingly likely uh, that we are going to see more restrictions imposed here in England. Now, they will be, to a large degree, actually restrictions that are elsewhere in place in the UK. For example, things like vaccine passports for attending large events like football games, theatres, cinemas, uh, for example. And also this idea that you should work from home, that that kind of advice will become a rule for millions of people again. There is, I think, a disconcerting sense of deja vu to a large degree around all of this, though we're still a long way off suggestions of any type of actual serious restrictions or lockdown on people's lives. And this does come at a time in which, you know, the news, the news on this new variant is pretty mixed, actually, largely. It does seem almost certainly that it is a lot more transmissible than the Delta variant, the dominant variant in the UK at the moment. Scientists this morning saying it could become the dominant variant, this is the Omicron variant, before Christmas. But the Pfizer chief has announced in the last couple of hours that his vaccine, particularly with a booster, seems to be pretty effective at neutralising this uh, variant. So a bit of a mixed picture in all of this, but I do think that we're probably likely to see further restrictions, as I say, if not announced today, in the days to come. Darren, another question for you, if I may. Tell us about the feeling on the back benches about how the Prime Minister is handling this situation, particularly on the Tory back benches. Yes, yeah, so speaking to lots of Conservative MPs today, they, they're just disappointed, I suppose, to a large degree, that they're again in this situation where 
frankly, lots of them have supported the Prime Minister over the last week about these allegations that there wasn't a Christmas party at all, no rules were broken and, and all that sort of stuff. And yet now it is clear that something took place in Downing Street. I mean, they wouldn't be investigated if it didn't. And as I say, I think the disappointment is that they're back again in this situation where the Prime Minister is knocking public confidence in the rules, essentially feeding into that Labour attack line that it is one rule for them and one rule for the rest of us. And while I wouldn't suggest, you know, this is terminal or anything for the Prime Minister, we're not going to see him quit over this, this succession of kind of scandals, mishaps, kind of own goals over the last couple of months whether the Owen Patterson affair, now this and others, is damaging the Prime Minister's credibility and is starting actually, I think, to force some of even his supporters to reconsider the fulsome support in the Prime Minister. Just real disgruntlement. And you've got the feeling of that in the chamber today. You know, you normally get an enormous roar from the Prime Minister when he walks in. Loud cheers when he answers those questions. They were pretty muted, Conservative MPs, today. You look at their faces... Uh, they were, as I say, not very happy. Labour, and obviously, in the opposition benches, feel that they have got the Prime Minister on the ropes and all of this. Uh, in the end, and this is the big problem, the story's not over. There are a lot more questions and a lot more answers being sought. Darren McCaffrey, interesting stuff. Darren McCaffrey there, GB News political editor outside Downing Street. After the break is all about your opinion. The big question we're asking today is how worried should we be? How worried are you about the Omicron variant? Join the debate. Let us know how you're feeling on De Piero and Halligan. That's after the... <laughs> you, you throw to the news, Liam. But first, it's the GB News headlines <laughs> with Paul Hawkins. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Boris Johnson has ordered an investigation into an alleged Downing Street Christmas party after a heated Prime Minister's questions. It follows that video leaked to ITV News showing the PM's former press secretary, Allegra Stratton, answering questions during a mock briefing four days after the alleged party happened while the country was under lockdown restrictions. Uh, the PM apologised for any offence caused by, uh, by the clip, but Labour leader Sakir Starmer says it raises more questions than answers. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson is believed to be considering new COVID restrictions, including orders to work from home and vaccine passports to manage the Omicron variant. Downing Street sources insist no decisions have been made. From today, if you're over 40 years old in England, you can now book your COVID booster jab three months after receiving your second dose of the vaccine. It follows official figures showing 101 additional cases of the Omicron variant in the UK, with the total now reaching 437. Roughly 1,000 properties are without power after Storm Barra swept across the country. Flood warnings have also been issued across the UK and a yellow weather warning for wind is in place across the west coast of Wales and southwest England until 6pm. Saudi man arrested in France on suspicion of being linked to the murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi has been released. French prosecutors say it's a case of mistaken identity. Jamal Khashoggi was killed in the Saudi embassy in Istanbul in October 2018. Boris Johnson says there will effectively be a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics in Beijing as UK ministers will not be attending. Australian and American diplomats are boycotting next year's Olympics over human rights concerns. Despite the move, Australian and UK athletes will still be able to compete in the Games. You're up to date with the latest headlines. We will have more on all those stories in 25 minutes. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back. In a moment, we'll be returning to our big debate of the day. Should you be concerned about the Omicron variant? But briefly, before that, let's get some reaction to Prime Minister's questions this afternoon, where Boris Johnson faced tough questions over an alleged Christmas party in Downing Street last year. What impact might this news have on voters? We can now speak to Professor of Political Marketing at the University of Leicester, Paul Baines. So, how much is it cutting through? Well, I think that um, it's, it is cutting through to some extent because um, people are very, very disappointed. There's quite a lot of distrust um, with uh, politicians. There has been since the sort of end of the first world, uh, Second World War, sorry. Um, but it, it has increased over the last uh, five or six years. But I think it's also particularly increased in the in in, in over this uh, last two years. Uh, because we've had various scandals of this type. Uh, Shropshire North by-election coming up soon, of course. Do you think we are now going to see the Tories relinquishing their lead in the opinion polls? For most of the last few months, they've been well ahead of Labour most of the time, but it strikes me that Labour's tracking back and making some ground. Well, I mean, you're right that uh, traditionally at this sort of time, halfway through the election cycle, you would expect the the, um, the party of government to be losing these seats anyway. A few seats here and there doesn't really matter in the great scheme of things because the government's got a thumping majority. But it's about the optics, really. The government doesn't want um, to, to lose this uh, to, to lose this by election because it could be the beginning. Of a, of a of a significant decline, and you're absolutely right that it's only relatively recently, since the Hancock affair, really, that uh, the um, voting intention for Labour and voting intention for Conservatives has coincided and they're more or less more or less equal within the margin of error. So it's not looking good. This will put uh, a dint in public support, and it could turn the tide because I suspect they should. The Conservatives should have won. The Batley and Spen by-election, it was previously Labour, but Hartlepool had gone Conservative. So it probably should have gone Conservative, but because of the Hancock affair, it didn't. And that was largely a, 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 you know, a similar uh, type of thing. It was an affair mixed with a, a breach of, of COVID rules. So if the public think uh, that, uh, that this is something that they're disgusted by, and they may well uh, feel that way, then those that would typically have voted Conservative might stay away. And those that would have th were, were thinking about maybe voting Conservative might well now decide to uh, reconsider their vote. So I do think it's dangerous for them. Paul Baines, thanks for that. That was Paul Baines, Professor of Political Marketing at the University of Leicester. Back to our debate today. We are asking how worried should we be about the new Omicron variant? The first real-world data shows the new strain may evade some of our immunity and the government are also reported to be looking at Plan B restrictions, including a work-from-home order. We're joined by David, Dr David Livermore, a professor in medical microbiology at the University of East Anglia and a co-signatory of the Great Barrington Declaration, which aimed to minimise the disruption restrictions could cause. Dr David, thanks a lot for joining us here on GB News. How worried do you think? My we pleasure. Be? 
How worried do you think we should be about the Omicron variant? Well, it's concerning in that it can spread very rapidly. That's what the South African data show. And it has some ability to evade vaccines. We can see that from a party in uh, Oslo in Norway, where one infected person seemingly infected uh, uh, 60 others, despite the fact that only vaccinated people could go to the party. So, yes, there is some concern. On the other hand, the evidence that's coming out from South Africa so far is that it seems to be associated with mild disease. Now, there is a caveat to that in that what happens with, um, with COVID is you get infected, and after um, four or five days, you start to show symptoms. Then after another week or so, uh, then you start seeing a few people develop more severe disease. And we only just and so up to the start of that period when you might see the severe cases. But they're not coming up so far. So there's, there's a view it may just cause mild disease, but we have to watch a little bit longer. And there's also the question of what it does when it gets into a hospital or a care home, because we know from experience that those those are the real settings where one can get uh, severe and lethal outbreaks of COVID. And the government is reportedly going to reintroduce working from home orders. That's sensible, isn't it, in order that we save Christmas? I, I don't think so. Ultimately, we have to let this virus circulate in the general population. We have seen that we can get vaccines, but they're leaky, they're imperfect, the virus can get around them. This virus, like the four existing coronaviruses, long existing coronaviruses, just has to bed down in the population. We'll all get infected a few times and we will all build up gradually a robust immunity. The sole issue, as we pointed out a year ago with the Great Barrington Declaration is how you best protect those people who are vulnerable and who are not able to build up that uh, natural immunity. And that does involve boosters. It involves trying to protect and shield them. But we have had two years of this unprecedented experiment, which went away against all pre-2020 pandemic planning of lockdowns, of working from home, etc., etc., masking everybody. And frankly, it has failed. It is, all it has done is to select for more transmissible variants with an altered spike protein that can perhaps get around the vaccines. Now, you signed the Great De Barrington Declaration, as we said in your introduction, written, of course, by Oxford, Shanetra Gupta, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Kaldor... Mm some of the world's leading epidemiologists. You want more focused shielding, particularly of vulnerable uh, people, elderly people, those with other medical conditions. To what extent do you think it's likely, if we do have another wave, that governments here around the world are going to actually listen to the great Barrington signatories? Well, I sincerely hope they do, because the models that governments have followed of lockdowns have fundamentally failed. We are two years in, and if you go back to Neil Ferguson's original paper, which was so critical to prompting the first lockdowns in the UK, 18 months in, the problem should have been resolved even without vaccines. That's not what's happened. We're much more in a situation as happened between 1889 and 1894 with the spread of the so-called Russian flu, which may actually have been a coronavirus of repeated spikes. In this case, we now know through uh, multiple variants. And we really just have to accept that it's going to bed in and we have to, to live with it and we should do our best to protect the vulnerable. The people who said we could lock down, the people who said we could uh, have zero COVID, they've had their day. They have failed. Dr Livermore, thank you for your time. David Livermore there, Professor in Medical Microbiology at the University of East Anglia. Well, any restrictions could impact schools once again, though there's no suggestion at the moment of any school closures. Pupils have already lost much valuable learning time since the beginning of the pandemic, though. Joining us now is Sue Hannam, head teacher at Litchfield Cathedral School. Hi, Sue. How much infection Hi. is there in, in our school settings? It's actually quite varied. Um, currently in the school here, we have got very, very low numbers. 
um, almost none currently in the pupil body and uh, about three members of staff. However, at the beginning of the academic year, we were hit really badly with immense um, amounts of absence. Um, at one point, I had 15 teachers out. Um, my big concern really with where we're heading now is that with this new variant, we're back to a situation where if somebody's been in contact um, with someone who has the new variant, even as a close contact, you're in a 10-day isolation window. Um, and we have had concerns over a member of our kitchen staff. Um, as it happens, with, luckily, they didn't have this variant, but it's sort of made us realise that if they had, then our entire kitchen staff are out. And obviously that creates a problem practically around school. And that's without even thinking about the impact on teaching um, with numbers of teachers and students to be out. renewed measures to limit kids' time in school? I think, really, speaking to other heads that I know, we want to keep children in school. Um, we want to keep schools open, and we have done that pretty much throughout. I mean, bearing in mind, even when we got the complete lockdown, schools were never in complete lockdown because we had um, vulnerable children in, we had key workers' children in, and we just kept going. And we found ways of working that appear to be safe. Um, you know, it isn't great being in old buildings with all the windows open you know we're all a bit chilly but you just wear a jumper um, the bubbles we don't have any more I guess that's something we could go back to while still keeping the children in school we are mask wearing Areas where we can't keep a sensible distance. So definitely our concerns are with youngsters who we know have been significantly affected in terms of their mental health and well-being, um, and particularly those vulnerable youngsters who are far better off in a school environment, um, not just to receive their education, but actually to be in a really safe place. Well, all the best to you, Sue, and your colleagues as you navigate these difficult times. Sue Hanneman. Hannam there, head teacher at Litchfield Cathedral School. Finally, if the government does, as expected, reintroduce some measures like working from home, especially after the Christmas party controversy, would people listen and follow the rules? We're now joined by the psychotherapist and broadcaster, Lucy Beresford. Well, Lucy, we're a long way from the lockdowns, which, and you know, no household mixing and all of that. Uh, stuff. Would the public buy that again, though, if it ever reared its head? Well, I think if you'd asked me this even a week ago, I might have said, yes, I think there would be really high compliance because intrinsically people want to keep themselves safe. Mm. And in fact, what we saw before the first lockdown was that people were taking measures before the government had ever actually introduced uh, any edict to lockdown. But the game has changed because of the latest revelations around the party, not least because a Christmas party is much more relatable, one might argue, than something around maybe driving to Barnard Castle mm -hmm. and trying to check your eyesight. That people can really see, you went to a party, I didn't go to a party. And issues around trust are so crucial in terms of the well-being of a state. You can't actually really function unless you have the trust of the majority of people. Now, there was some polling that came out only this weekend that showed that nearly 60% of people, for example, believe that Boris Johnson doesn't keep his promises. Well, in that really exquisite dynamic that you have between a leader and the led, mm. you need to feel, just as you would if you were a child and you're being parented, do I really trust these people to keep me safe and can I respect what they say to me? It's all about consent, isn't it, rather than actual political power, Lucy. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with you. I actually think there's been a shift in public opinion, even before uh, this video emerged, the video which has obviously wound lots of people up, uh, understandably. Just last week, YouGov released some polling showing that uh, uh, many, many more people than previously felt that more restrictions wouldn't be necessary. How does a government try and rein that back? Because clearly, 
I mean, most people would think if we do need to lock down, then we should lock down, but people just don't want to be treated as fools, do they? They don't want to be treated as fools, but there is a very unspoken rule around the electorate, which is that we vote for you. So in a sense, we are giving you permission to make decisions on our behalf. Mm. That's a, you could say it's an infantilization, but on some level, that's the trade-off that we make. We're, we're not standing for parliament. We're giving other people the chance to do that. I think issues around maybe the Owen Paterson affair, for example, also eroded that sense of trust that we could really believe what people say to us. And if you start to not believe someone, you know what it's like if you have a teenager they have blindly subscribed to everything that you have said up until that point. And then when they start to think for themselves or take different decisions, then they start to answer back. They I know the feeling. Back chat. <laughs> and we've all been there. We've all been teenagers. We've all been pushing those boundaries. And I think what's going to happen now, and you heard it partly because of one of your previous guests who was talking about the scientific way that mm. they would deal with it in terms of herd immunity. When you're getting different messaging coming at you as an electorate, you're going to make your own decision. You're not going to necessarily say OK, the government is saying one thing. If I was in the government, I would want the messaging to be way clearer than it is and much more consistent. Probably only one or two messages as opposed to a whole hodgepodge of messages that come out every day. So they introduced mandatory mask wearing in crowded places a couple of weeks ago. They look set to introduce work from home guidance for probably a limited period, one would hope. These are not big restrictions. The public will go along with, with things like that. Well, there are still some people who regard mask wearing as an affront to their liberty. And I think it's really important to recognise that you will do what you feel is right for you in order to keep yourself safe. Because particularly we are imitative creatures. So yeah. if we see people in power not subscribing mm. to those rules, they're not wearing the masks or, again, having a party, an alleged party, um, then we will think, well, if it's OK for you, then I will also follow your lead. That's where the messaging becomes really muddled. So it is, it is about simple messaging, clear messaging and consistent messaging. Professor Neil Ferguson about a year ago said that when this initially started, this whole COVID episode, they kind of assumed, the scientists, that you couldn't impose lockdown in a liberal democracy like the UK. Then it happened in China and then it happened in Italy. Are you surprised at how compliant we have been up until now? No, I don't think I, I am surprised at all. And that kind of goes back to Freud's theory, which is the survival instinct, that in, instinctively we will do that thing that keeps us safe, which is why sometimes herd behaviour doesn't always cut through because there will always be that person that steps back and thinks, actually, this does look like really insane behaviour, so I'm not going to follow through because my life is at risk, which is why, again, from all of the um, research that was shown at the beginning, before lockdown, at the beginning mm. of March, Nearly three quarters of people were not travelling as much as they were meant to, even before the government told us to lock down. Lucy Beresford, thanks a lot for joining us here on GB News. Very interesting. You've been watching De Piero and Halligan on GB News. We are back tomorrow at two. I'm back at midday. He's back at one. For now, we'll leave you with the weather forecast. Thanks for joining us. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Storm Barra may be now easing, but it stays windy through the rest of today with further showers or, in some places, prolonged rain. But there will be some drier periods. Barra is still centred across the UK, but it's filling. It's becoming less severe. Nevertheless, strong winds continue to rotate around that low, particularly around the peripheries of it, northeast Scotland, into parts of Northern Ireland, West Wales, and the southwest. And it's for West Wales, as well as the southwest, where the strongest wind gusts will be this afternoon, 65 mile per hour wind gusts at risk of disruption. And further bands of showers and rain affecting northeast Scotland, Northern Ireland, parts of Western England and Wales. Prolonged rain in places. So feeling quite cold where we've got the rain coming through, where we've got that strong wind, highs of just 8 Celsius. But there will be some drier weather. The Midlands, East Anglia, South East England, Western Scotland the favoured spots for some drier and brighter interludes at times through the day and overnight clearing skies across parts of northern UK in particular with lighter winds eventually will lead to a touch of frost in places say for northeast England parts of central Scotland otherwise a lot of cloud and further showers coming